Swami Priyananda, thank you so much for being here today. It's for this my interview. pleasure. Yeah. Um, I have to tell you, I loved your book, Paramahansa Yogananda's A Biography. And it's such an honor to be here with you and to hear the personal stories. You spent personal time with him. Please share one of your favorites. Well, I think my very favorite is one time I was sitting at his feet at 29 Palms where he had his retreat and he was working on uh, editing his Bhagavad Gita commentaries. And I was just thinking how fortunate I was to be his disciple. And when he finished after about half an hour, he asked me to help him to his feet. And he looked at me very closely, closer than you are now. And he said, just a bulge of the ocean. In other words, don't think of me as the guru, God is the guru. Oh, what a beautiful story. It was beautiful. And the, energy behind it was beautiful. I love when Yogananda talks about thou art the ocean, I am the wave, yes. we are one. Yeah. It's very inspiring. Beautiful. So you talk in your book about some of the miracles. Did you see a miracle that Yogananda... I saw a number. There was one time I was with a brother disciple. We were, of course, much younger than I am now. <laughs> <clears throat> and we were plastering a building. And uh, I was mixing the plaster and he was putting it on. And the plaster this day was very old and I had to keep working it to keep it liquid. And we had just poured a new batch of plaster on the board when Yogananda drove by and called to us. So we happily went down and talked to him and we were there about half an hour. And in the back of our minds were we were happy to be with him, but we thought when we get back to that plaster, we'll have to take a sledgehammer to it. And we got back, it was completely soft, stayed soft the whole day. Wow. So that was one little miracle. Another was an amazing one. I had been asked to do the yoga postures at a bar mitzvah in Beverly Hills. I'm not Jewish, but they wanted me to do the postures. So afterwards, uh, very atheistic, materialistic psychiatrist grabbed me and was trying to grill me about our teachings. And I told him about a few miracles I had seen. And I could see him um, mentally thinking, well, Wednesday at 11, I can see this patient. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, the next uh, two days later, I saw Yogananda because I used to serve him when he had guests, I'd serve lunch. And after the guests left, I'd sit with him and he'd talk. And he, he said, by the way, when you're with atheists and materialists, don't talk about miracles. I said, you knew. He said, I know every thought you think. That was an astounding statement, but he, he reinforced it repeatedly. Wow. Yeah. I love the story in the book where you talk about the glass windows. And when he went to the salvage yard and the owner's like, there's oh, no glass marvelous. windows. Yeah. Share with us the glass windows story. When he was building the Hollywood church, it was during the Second World War. Mm -hmm. And so new construction was not possible. <clears throat> so he thought, all right, I'll get an old building and put it on the property. And for months afterwards, the neighbors complained at this wreck that was sitting there. <laughs> but he plastered it over and made it beautiful. The one thing he still didn't have was stained glass windows. And so he asked God and he had a vision. And he went to a junk shop and he asked the owner if he had any stained glass windows. No, we don't have any. So Yogananda knew that he did. So he paid the attendant um, five dollars, which at that time was a lot of money. And he said, will you take me where I'd like you to go? The man began Boss say no. <laughs> and uh, anyway, finally he took him into the backyard and Yogananda, uh, he saw there was nothing. And you see, boss say no. Yogananda said, take me to that pile of stuff, boards and things, piled against the wall. And finally, the, with money, you know, lazy people tend to mumble and grumble to themselves. <laughs> so mumbling and grumbling, he pulled these things away right at the back. There were these stained glass windows. Amazing. All whole, sort of falling apart. The panes were all in place, but uh, it looked like junk. He got it for a song, and then he, put, he 
brought, brought, it, brought it back to Hollywood Church, and they put all the panes in and carefully put gold leaf around it. Now they look like jewels. Wow. So he was able to find yeah. jewels in a junkyard. Yeah. By having a divine vision. Exactly. And you saw a lot of these visions. When did you enter into Yogananda's life? I came toward the end of his life. Mm -hmm. I think it was necessary that I come toward the end because uh, my life has been dedicated to getting him known, right. getting his message known. And I've written 141 books and done a lot of work that way. Anyway, I came to him when I was 22 in September 1948. This is such a beautiful personal book. How long did it take you to write it? Three weeks. Three weeks. I can, I can write pretty quickly. <laughs> wow. Usually I have to do a lot of editing. I had almost no editing to do on this one. Inside the book, you talk about the concept of magnetism. Could you explain that to well, you us? Know, there are many kinds of magnetism. Modern science is very primitive, mm -hmm. and it only knows that sort of thing that you get from a magnet and so on. But people have magnetism. Mm -hmm. When people, sometimes you meet people, you feel drawn to them. That's magnetism. Sometimes people who are evil will have a magnetism that can draw you down. Mm -hmm. There was one man who used to exercise that magnetism on people, and Yogananda said, don't do that. Mm -hmm. And one time he saw him at a party, and this man was being heckled by a young girl, young woman. And a few minutes later, he looked over, this girl was following him around like a puppy. You're going to decide, I told you you shouldn't do it. He said, I know, but she was getting my goat. <laughs> <laughs> so there are good magnetism and there's bad magnetism. You're going to have that extraordinarily good magnetism. In his presence, you just felt clean. Mm -hmm. And magnetism, it's very important. When you shake hands with somebody, the two parts of the body, the upper and the lower, form two horseshoe magnets. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a real exchange of magnetism that way. I know he told me, when I was a very young disciple, he told me to stand up the, side the church when he'd given the service and greet people and shake hands with them. I said to him the first day, I said, please don't ask me to do that again. I felt dizzy because they, knowing that I was his disciple, were drawing energy from me. So he said, that's because you're thinking of yourself. Think of God and his energy will, re will re replenish you. So after that, I thought of God and I found myself blessed by blessing others. Is that an instruction for all of us? Yes. That we should just think of God? Think of God and remember your, your magnetism, if you're angry, that magnetism will be a downward pulling one. Mm -hmm. Try to keep your anger to yourself. Try to keep your bad moods to yourself. Yogananda said, I suffer when you have moods because I see that Satan, Satan has a hold of you. Mm -hmm. So there are two forces in the world and one is the pulling toward God. The other is that outward manifesting power of God in creating the universe. And that's the satanic thing. And we're right on a fence between the two. If we go one way, Satan pulls us. If we go the other way, God pulls us. But our thoughts are not our own. We are transmitting stations for whatever thoughts we're, whatever level of consciousness we're on. So I remember one time I fell into a mood. I was about 22 still. And uh, I tried to argue my way out of it. Trouble is reason always follows feeling. Mm -hmm. And so I kept thinking of all the reasons why I should be moody, why this world is no damn good and so on. <laughs> and uh, then I thought, well, if my thinking won't do it, maybe something else will. So I sat down and meditated and put my mind here very strongly. And after five minutes, I was in a completely different mood. So if you have a mood, don't try to reason your way out of it. Mm -hmm. Put your mind here. You'll come out of it very quickly. Swami, you teach a lot about meditation. For those of us 
who are just watching this and want to get started, where can you start meditating? I'd say that it would be very good to learn lessons mm -hmm. because it's not something, you know, when I was first seeking God, mm -hmm. I first decided to seek God, I realized that was the goal of life. I, I was going to go to South America and uh, go into a jungle and become a hermit. <laughs> Thank God I didn't. I wouldn't have known <laughs> what to do. It's good to know how to meditate, to be taught. And so there's a book of mine mm -hmm. that I have written called The Essence of Raja Yoga. And that would be a very good one to start with. Wonderful. Yeah. So inside the book, my favorite chapter is about reincarnation. Yeah. And specifically, Yogananda's reincarnation, but all of us apparently come back well, you know, many, many times. You know, when you look at people, any crowd of people, mm -hmm. they're so obviously on different levels of understanding. Mm -hmm. You don't get that from your DNA. Yes. You come with memories. You know, when I was seven years old, I wrote a paper. <coughs> and uh, my parents criticized it because they said you use and too much. You know, all children talk and this, and then I went there and then I... And so they said you use too many hours. I knew they were right. But there was a strange voice inside me that I myself knew was ridiculous. Mm -hmm. But that voice said, who is anyone to tell me how to write? <laughs> well, that's because I had the memory of being a writer. Right. And so you can tell children, before the age of seven usually, they bring many of their tendencies. Mm -hmm. And you can tell from those strong tendencies what they should learn in this life. I notice that with my own children. Yeah. If I just pay attention, I, I yeah. see certain skills and abilities yeah. that they naturally have. Yeah. And you're saying that comes that, from their past lives. Yeah. It's a beautiful thought. Talk to us a little bit about, Yogananda speaks inside your book about being a vegetarian. Well, vegetarianism isn't really, although naturally you don't want to kill, but after all, you have to kill vegetables to eat them. Right. So <clears throat> the main thing is that in eating meat, especially red meat, mm -hmm. pigs, cows, veal, that the animals have emotions, they're more highly evolved. Mm -hmm. You know, life comes up from the animal level. In fact, it comes up from the stone all the way up to the human level. But uh, they, they, have, uh, they have fear and anger, and you take on their vibrations when you eat meat. So meat eaters tend to be more irascible, for example, mm -hmm. more fearful. Vegetarians tend to be more self-controlled, more peaceful. Mm. So that's a large part of it. Of course, one, if one is sensitive, I remember when I was, I think, six or so years old, I was born in Romania. My parents were American. But we went out on Lake Snagov, went fishing. And when I saw those two little fish we snagged wriggling there, I felt so badly for, <laughs> the, for the fish. Throw them back. <laughs> <laughs> so then we... He took us rabbit hunting. I was so glad we never got a rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's why you were walking loudly through the forest. Yeah. <laughs> so share with me, Yogananda also talks, um, and you share this inside the book, about a twin soul. You know, in our world today, people are like, my twin flame, my soulmate. Yeah, what but does that's that mean? easily tossed around. Yeah. People meet their soulmates on every street corner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, everything is dual. Right. And so he, he didn't talk about it much because he didn't want people thinking, oh, here's my soulmate. Right. But uh, he said that even if, you, if your soulmate's living on another planet, you'll have to unite with that soul in vision mm -hmm. before you can find God. So I believe there is such a thing. And before you find liberation, you will probably meet your soulmate. This is my belief, but he didn't talk much about it. Yeah, I think you said he only spoke of it one time. One time. And I never heard it. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when you were writing the book, what was one of the fondest memories that came up for you personally? One of the sweetest moments in your time well, with Well, I Yogananda? told you that with the time he was right. editing. That was my sweetest moment. There were others, 
when I would just feel his magnetism. I, mm -hmm. I remember out at 29 Palms again, and I was about to leave the room, and I just looked back at him. I used to be very nearsighted before I had laser mm -hmm. surgery. Yes. And uh, so it wasn't his expression, but I just glanced back at him, and I felt so much love yeah. pouring over me that I felt like crying. What was he like in person? In person, he was extremely loving, but he was also very firm. Mm -hmm. He was a guru. He had to discipline us. I never, some people would feel that he was very harsh with them. I never felt that. Right. I always would see in his eyes this regret that he had to talk to me fiercely to make something really sink in. But there was nothing but egolessness there. There are millions of people out there who believe that Yogananda is their guru. But we were talking before that people need a physical guru. He told me personally, this is against what their, his organization has declared. They have said he's the last of the gurus. He told me personally that you have to meet and be blessed by your guru at least once in this lifetime. That means for those poor Suckers who are no longer, <laughs> he's no longer here. Are they, they have nothing? No, he has to do it through his disciples. Mm -hmm. It's like a baton that you pass on. When do you know that you will find your guru? That's a tough one. Many people go to teachers. Uh, I can say this, that I didn't have to, I didn't have to walk the counter. Mm -hmm. When I knew him, I knew that was my guru. And I don't know how you know. I think it has to be intuitive. And the uh, last question I wanted to ask you is, Yogananda has such timeless, beautiful messages, and you've channeled so many of them in your life's work. How do you believe that they are so important and powerful in the world that we live in today? You know, he told us that in a, in a past life, he was really the conqueror. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I who had been brought up in the English system, I'd always thought of William the Conqueror as one of history's great villains. Right. And I thought he was my own guru. <laughs> so I had to do a lot of research. And I found out that he was a very great man. And it was historians. The history is a lie agreed upon. That's what Napoleon zigged them, and it's true. And uh, he, in fact, 430 years after his death, they exhumed his body and found it incorrupt. Mm -hmm. That only happens to great saints. So he was a, his only close friends were uh, saintly people like Lan Frank and Anselm and so on. And uh, he was a very wise person, very self-controlled. And he had to be fierce because he lived in a fierce age. He was an avatar. Mm -hmm. And here's the difference. When you attain union with God, then you leave all your life, past lives behind you, and you merge in the infinite. Most people, after millions and millions of lives, they reach that point, they just think, that's it. <laughs> <that." laughs> I'm done. Except that they have no hands to... <laughs> anyway, a very few people, mm -hmm. after reaching that state, out of compassion for mankind, come back and help others. Those who come back from that highest state are known as avatars. Mm -hmm. People use that word avatar too loosely, ridiculously. In my avatar as a banker, that sort of thing. Yeah. No, a real avatar is one who has attained union with God and then comes back into this world with that complete freedom. And he can, like Jesus Christ, he was an avatar. Buddha was an avatar. Yogananda was an avatar. There have been others, but not that many. Those avatars they may come back many times. Yogananda said, I killed Yogananda long ago, many lifetimes ago. No one dwells in this body but God. And he wrote in a poem called God's Boatman, I will come back if need be a trillion times, as long as one stray brother is weeping by the wayside. Mm -hmm. That kind of compassion is hard to understand. Because what it means is that they defer their final complete merging in that bliss mm -hmm. to help mankind. What a beautiful promise from Yogananda to all of us. 
in fact. Yes. Well, Swami, I, I just love this book. I want to show the cover of it. And there are just just countless beautiful pieces. It's got many pieces. stories. Yes. You know, he couldn't write about himself. Right. And he couldn't write about his greatness. He couldn't write about his miracles. There are at least 60 stories in this. Yeah, I just that loved it. The it's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for the gift of this beautiful book and your time today. May I tell you one more miracle? Oh, please. It's in this book. Okay. It's really amazing. He, he, he said, a, ma a master will only reveal these things to highly advanced souls. Mm -hmm. And one of his most advanced disciples was Mr. Black. In, in, he lived in Detroit. And Mr. Black came to Encinitas to visit Yogananda. And uh, it was raining cats and dogs outside when a monk came and told him that Master wanted to go riding with him. He looked at the <laughs> rain and he thought, well, we won't be able to look out the window even. But he thought, okay, so if he says it, I'll be glad to be with him anyway. So he left the door. As he left the door, looked out the window, it was still raining cats and dogs. He got to the front door, which was only yards away. He came outdoors, blue sky, dry ground, dry car, and Yogananda looked at him. He said, "For you, Oliver." That he could change the dream to that extent that suddenly the rain hadn't happened—that mm -hmm. was an amazing thing. Amazing. Yeah.